So I've never used BlackBerry. I did watch the documentary, the dr the drama about the BlackBerry experience. It's very interesting. Did you ever actually work under the BlackBerry banner, or did you leave when the company was sold? Or the founder of uh, the company called Certicom that later BlackBerry acquired was Dr. Scott Vanstone, who was later my husband. So when I started at Certicom, we were not involved with each other. We became involved and I left Certicom and went to work for MasterCard for several years. Sherry Shannon Vanstone is the founder, president, and CEO of Profound Impact Corporation, a Canadian data analytics company that leverages AI and machine learning to provide solutions for higher education and research sectors. She started her career as a cryptographer for the NSA, then built up sales channels across Asia for a private company before joining the team that created the cryptographic algorithm that powered the BlackBerry and was ultimately acquired by Research in Motion. And she's been part of two acquisitions and two IPOs in her life. Today, she spends her additional time building up women in STEM and startups, and you'll hear about all of this in our interview. I chose to interview Sherry because I don't often get to come across women like her that are really strong and capable and have a storied career in entrepreneurship and especially in mathematics. So I love talking with her. She was really interesting and very giving. And I hope you enjoy what we talked about, which is what it was like being a woman in STEM, especially in the 1980s and 90s, the algorithm that was sold. Uh, there's a documentary that came out about BlackBerry. So we talked a little bit about the founders and what, uh, you know, whether the documentary was truthful about who they were. Uh, we talked about the IPOs and acquisitions and what she's learned from them and uh, women funding women. She's getting really involved in that because she realized that there are just not enough women that are getting funded. And there's a lot of women with a lot of money that are capable of funding them. And so she's in the middle trying to help women learn how to become angel investors. And lastly, what was the most important thing that she's learned from life so far? So I know you'll enjoy Sherry. She's very interesting. Let's get to the show. You've had a long career. And from what I understand, it's been mostly positive. I'm curious to know what got you into this industry, into engineering, you know, people call this STEM, right? What, what got you into a STEM career to begin with? Was it someone in your family that excited you? Was it a teacher, a mentor? I would say all of those in particular. When I was around seven or eight, my father started taking an uh, international correspondence course. He was an uh, operating engineer. He wanted to become an electrical engineer. So this was not an online course. It was before then. It was a paper. It, it got... You received a, a booklet, you worked through it, then you sent it back in the mail. It was graded. They sent you back the results plus another booklet. So I started working through those booklets uh, with my father, and a lot of it was math. So uh, this is probably second grade I was in. I, I grew up in Ohio. and uh, So by fifth grade, they do these international standardized tests, and I scored 10th grade. In, in math at that time. And one of my, my teachers shared that information with me, which just encouraged me. And then when I went to junior high and high school, I had all women math teachers, which was unusual. And they all encouraged me to continue to study in mathematics. And that was uh, what happened all the way up to university. I started the university and I said, oh, what am I going to do with mathematics? I'll, oh, I'll be, I'll be an accountant. So I start studying accounting at the University of Miami, Miami of Ohio. And I was interviewing, for some reason, I also thought I could be a journalist. I was interviewing the president of the university, maybe like the second week of, of the university. And he asked me what I was studying after I, we finished our interview. And I told him, and he asked me what my scores were on my ACT. And I told him, he goes, oh, no, 
you got to be in mathematics. So he changed all my courses to from accounting to mathematics. And I, I didn't mind him doing that. In fact, I, it, it uh, led me to where I am today. So not only, you know, those individuals, but other individuals along the way encouraged me to continue studying at, in mathematics and get a de- degree, a master's degree. And then I went and worked for the National Security Agency as a cryptologic mathematician, making codes and breaking codes. That means encryption, confidentiality, security, that area. What was the hardest thing about working in that kind of a field in those days, especially for the government? I, the government was very good and very uh, equitable and, and quite diverse. It was, it was earlier when I was deciding what to go to graduate school. One of my professors, my undergrad, just flat out told me I shouldn't go. Uh, he said, you're only going to find a husband, leave the space for a man. Um, I, but I didn't, you know, I didn't tune into that frequency. I, you know, yeah, you have your opinion. I ignored it. So it really wasn't, um, uh, you know, very, a, a lot of people try to remove barriers instead of present barriers. And so I really had a great career with very few huge barriers. Uh, when I finally, I was in this office at, with, the, with the US government and I love this office. It was, turned out to be my last office with them, the, the assignment. And I walked in one day and I heard the group of men, I worked with all men. And they said, if she can handle the heat, she's better get out of the kitchen. Now, and of course I knew they were talking about me, but you know what, I decided I'm not going to fight that battle. That's not, not going to choose. I didn't even ask them what they were talking about. I went on. I did my job. I was the first to volunteer for all the new and exciting assignments. And uh, I had a great uh, a career there. So it was because I didn't, I didn't take the minor things and make them major things. I just let that go and say, this is not a battle that I fight. But er, uh, after that, my immediate boss, he was a little bit, well, not a little bit, he was volatile at times, and he liked to yell at people. And uh, he did that to some of the admin staff on a regular basis. But when he did it to me one day, I stopped him and I said, you don't talk to me like that. Don't ever talk to me like that again. He backed down and he never did. So choosing your battles along the way, whether you're male or female, is very, very important. But in particular, I think females, we need to make sure that we choose the right battles to fight. So what do you think would have happened if you had fought more often, especially when you heard them making those comments to you or in, in around you? I think they would have felt that I was a little bit too sensitive, which I can be. Uh, uh, so... I didn't really know what the conversation was about to dig down into it. I could have called, talked to my boss later about it, but I thought it was best that to me it was, they were talking about me. I must be doing something right or wrong, right? But at least I have their attention, right? So uh, I just made the decision that it wasn't that it, it, it hurt me, but of course, you know, let that go. Um, but it didn't hurt that deeply. So I decided... A, Again, I don't know where where I got that filter from, but I I've been very strong um, in standing up for certain things and then not compromising, but saying, you know, this is not the battle I want to fight. Uh, this is uh, it's small. It, it's there's there are many occasions that this happened, but I just let it just bounce off of me. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't know where that comes from. I think it's just trying to figure out what are your priorities. How do you move forward? You don't want to be a crybaby, but you don't want to be insensitive either. So it's in between. And I can tell you, I I I might have gone into the bathroom and cried, <laughs> but I wasn't going to let them see me upset about this. I remember you telling me that you would go to Japan for work sometimes, was this after the time we're talking about and before your work on the algorithm 
that uh, was for, that was for BlackBerry? Because I, I forgot. I want to make sure I go kind of in a chronological order. Yeah. So I was with the U.S. government. I left there uh, there in 1988 and went to work in Silicon Valley with a startup in information security. They asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, "I want to. I want to be your, your director of sales in Asia Pacific." They said yes. They didn't have anyone there, so they'd already had a relationship in Japan. And so then I went and I set up all the distribution channels in 13 countries by myself, traveled and did that. It was an exciting time. And getting to work with the Japanese people, uh, mostly men, was uh, a great uh, challenge and honor. They treated me as an anomaly. I wasn't a man. I wasn't a woman. The my male counterparts there, <laughs> they even said, Sherry son, you're, you're not, you're not either. And would laugh uh, at that. And, uh, but what it did was what happened was because of my credentials with, as a mathematician, I was highly respected by them and they would listen to me. If I'd have been a, a, a Japanese woman, I don't know if they would have listened to me. But because, and then also because I wasn't a man, they treated me differently because they didn't really, as I said, they thought I was an anomaly. Anyway, it was a great time. It was a great challenge. Very successful there in the relationship. But I, I want to tell you one thing that happened was when I joined and I started, I was director of sales for Asia Pacific, because the company already had a relationship with this Japanese firm, they didn't like me at first. And they called the president of the company and said, we don't like Sherry San. Uh, we think we need to work with somebody else. And although my boss at this uh, uh, company, was, it was a male chauvinist, uh, he stood up for me and said, if you want to work with us, you're working with Sherry. If he had not done that, I would have I would have lost all credibility and not been as successful as I was. I would have said I'd probably been zero successful in, in that environment. So he stood up for me, and I did appreciate that, that he said this, and that was strong. He didn't say, oh, if you want to work with one of the men on our team, you can. But he said that, and that set me up for success. Now, you said they called you Sherry San. Typically, San is meant for a man. Yeah. Well, as I said, they, they called me Sherry son. And, uh, because I, again, I don't think they knew how to address me. Uh, anyway, it was, that's what they called me. I went along with it. I didn't mind. I didn't take any offense to it. I just think, yeah. And then later, oh, well, anyway, there's so many stories about Japan and I enjoyed that. Uh, I spent six years doing that work and it was, uh, along with all the other stories about all the other countries. Uh, it was very rewarding, and it taught me a lot about resilience. Um, startups, my first startup, and how you feel like you take one step forward and two steps back every day, <laughs> and you go, oh, my gosh, am I making any progress here at all? And then you find out you know, one step at a time, uh, one action at a time, and I built up the business from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars uh, for this company in Silicon Valley. I felt that way living in China sometimes that you'd feel like, okay, I'm meeting the right people, the right opportunities are in front of me, and then nothing would get done. Because as an American, I was used to, all right, we meet, we shake hands, like, that's it, we're in business. The Chinese don't do that. And I imagine the Japanese are very similar. It's like, okay, well, we're going to do business, but I want to become your friend first. Let's go for a meal. Let's get drunk. Let's like really get to know each other to see if we can actually do business. And then like months later, you're like, come on, dude, can we just do business? And they're like, I don't feel like I know you well enough yet. Sorry. I don't know if you ever had that kind of an experience or. Uh, I did. And mostly uh, with the uh, non Western individuals that I was dealing with. However, uh, Australia, I spent a lot of time in Australia, loved Australian people, and we really did get to bond. bond. Uh, again, I was working with just men. I learned how to drink in Australia. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, 
uh, it's, uh, it's quite humorous, but it's true, uh, that getting to know the people meant a lot of social, uh, a lot of dinners, a lot of lunches, a lot of lunches that became dinners. Uh, and it was uh, great. I was in Australia three weeks out of every quarter, pretty much. And they felt like I was there all the time. And that's what I wanted them to think, that I'm here for you. I'm, I'm not going to go back to Silicon Valley, to California, and you're not going to hear from me again. I'm here. And that's really what built up the relationship. I dealt with the, with in, in Hong Kong. I never was in mainland China at that time. We didn't go into that area until later. Uh, I set up an office in Singapore. I love that country, too. Great people there. Very hardworking. Uh, a lot of women in that area. But that was the only women that I worked with were that were in Singapore. Uh, but again, Japan. Uh, anyway, it was it was uh, it was a great opportunity for me. I grew a lot. I learned so much, and it was on the job training. Then I I decided I loved what I was doing, but I wasn't influential enough in the company and the senior management. I was one of the senior managers, but I wasn't enough. I didn't have enough clout or influence to change the culture. And the culture was not uh, that. It was quite toxic, I'll say that, especially for females. Even for the women who worked for me, I tried to protect them and make sure that they, uh, they, were, uh, they were treated fairly at all times. But I had to stand up to my, the CEO numerous times. We even had yelling matches in front of the whole company at times. So I decided, that's when I decided I needed to leave Silicon Valley and uh, go somewhere where I could have more influence in the culture. And for some reason, I decided to come to Canada. So that's how I came to Canada 29 years ago and uh, later married a Canadian and stayed here. But it's, uh, I've been in like four startups here in Canada. And so including uh, the one that was sold to BlackBerry. We did all the security for BlackBerry. Yeah, so I, I did want to talk about that. So I've never used BlackBerry. I did watch the documentary, the dr the drama about the BlackBerry experience. It's very interesting. I don't know if you've watched it. Maybe you have. I mean, you probably lived some of it. You probably saw some of the things that they talked about in the, the documentary. What was it like working? Did, did, did you ever actually work under the BlackBerry banner or did you leave when the company was sold or and that will affect some of the questions I want to ask, I guess. Yeah. So the founder of uh, the company called Certicon that later BlackBerry acquired was Dr. Scott Vanstone, who was later my husband. So when I started at Certicon, we were not involved with each other. We became involved and I left Certicon and went to work for MasterCard for several years. During that time, uh, Certicom continued to build. Of course, I was part of it because my husband was part of, uh, of it. He was the founder and on the board of directors and the chief scientist. So, yes, I was around it all the time. Uh, I later came back as a consultant after BlackBerry acquired Certicom. I came back and worked for BlackBerry, but only for a short period of time. Uh, did, did I work for maybe a year or two? And so, yes, yeah, so I, but I had plenty of occasions to work with both Mike Lazaridis and Jim Bosley. And I think the commentary was right on about Bosley. They, they got him right. I don't think, I did not think that they, that they got Mike Lazaridis right as far as his character. Uh, anyway, I, it was interesting to watch the movie. I saw it in a premiere at, uh, in Toronto and Jim Bosley was in the audience. So, he, uh, he, yeah. Anyway, uh, that organization really, it, it, was, it was one of, you know, it was, uh, something to, to be proud of and then something to learn from about how not to run a company at the end, especially, and the decisions they made. And I think the movie portrayed the, the struggles they had, especially with, with Apple coming on the scene. You know, they were, they were enterprise. Only in the beginning, they didn't go after the consumer market, but they decided to do that. 
with when you bring your own devices, more companies started doing that instead of demanding that everyone use a BlackBerry, which of course was more secure because we built the security in from the beginning into the operating system where Apple bolted on their security. So in those days, the security was stronger for uh, the BlackBerry. So yeah, so it was uh, also a great opportunity to learn from um, how to scale a company. And that was what we were trying to do with Certicom. Although, you know, I, I was on the peripheral just as a consultant now and then, um, but it was to how, how to take a startup and then scale it. And then of course, then being acquired, how to become valuable within to, in the company that acquires you is not easy to do. I found that out later when I sold my last company. So this is all a uh, learning and an experience. And I would say most of it was positive. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work and every week we bring you a new guest and a new story and what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much and we'll take you back to the show now. So I want to know more about this. I have a potential offer for one of my companies and I would be required to stay on and build things up again um, because my company ceased operations a year ago. So the assets are there, but the team is gone. There's no, there's nothing, it's just me and, and the assets. So they would be acquiring the assets and hiring me to take cash that they're going to inject into the company and start it again. And how, so how can I make myself useful? Because I would be selling all of my shares or rather they would be giving me cash and shares, but the shares would be in the parent organization, um, which is publicly listed. And so I, yeah, I just, if there's any advice you have for me, that would be excellent. Uh, th this was a tough one for me. I, I, I just stayed on for a year. The difference is I was not made the leader. I was, they knew I was leaving. So I committed to, they asked for a two years commitment. I made a one year commitment with an option to renew if we both mutually agreed. Uh, mm -hmm. But all I know with this, with the acquisition, especially like with the, with the um, acquisition of Certicom by BlackBerry, there is often a lot of responsibility with no authority. So I caution you to make sure that with this responsibility of building up your team, that you have the authority to do what you need to do, to hire, fire, set the, set the strategy. That's, that's what I've seen in the past. They're easy, they're ready to give you the responsibility, but not necessarily the authority. So it would remain a subsidiary. So it'd be a totally separate entity. Yes. Yes. That's great. So they would, there would be a board. So I would be one of the members, uh, the investor from my original company who is making the deal happen would remain on in the, the larger company. He would be on the board and then another one of their board members would be on the board. So there'd be three people. So technically the investors on things like I've known him for seven or eight years. So he's basically on my side in that regard. As long as I don't do anything dumb, he'll vote with me. Um, so it'd be a th three person board. Yeah, it would, it would be good to have, it, yeah. Oh, so you're gonna have a three person board and maybe have an independent too would be good. Uh, what I found again with that is that, is, is this a private equity firm? That's uh... They're a publicly listed company and it's kind of like a, a shell that has a bunch of cash and it's acquiring a bunch of companies and building like a portfolio. Yeah. Okay. I would define that as private equity firm. firm. 
firm. Uh, just I just find that what I've learned too is that sometimes the investors see this that they're looking for short term, and there there needs to be a long term play too. I think you probably already know that. Uh, you have a sense of you you already had this company up and running. So you know the obstacles that you ran into before and then how you're going to achieve those. You, hopefully, I don't know if you can get the same team back together, but you can get quality people. So, okay, that, you know, there's, there is a, a chance that you want, but I think you probably, with your connections, you would be able to get to put together a good team. What are the true obstacles? Make sure that they understand those, your, your, your board and the investors, because the board itself I just see, I've just seen this happen again and again that uh, they, I'm not saying they're going to do it as your case, but they start taking back some of the authority and inserting their own people in the, and into the team and that those people are not necessarily team players and then they, they disrupt the team. So just if you could, if you have a good relationship already with your, your investor, then you can, you He's, you know, it's like a mentor, a mentee relationship, maybe that you can honestly say to him, just say, this is, this is what my concerns are. And, and a conversation, communication. I sold to a German company and the culture was quite different. Uh, there were no women in, in leadership there. I should have seen that as a flag. Uh, and, uh, I don't know if it would have changed anything. It might have. I think I even told you that the week after I signed the LOI with with the firm, I, I, I received an offer from a woman-owned company here in Canada. And I go, shoot. I said, I've talked to her before I signed. Uh, at least just ask her her advice in general terms about selling. I did, I did, I did reach out to a few other people that I knew to talk about the, the acquisition and get their input. But for some reason, I didn't ask her about her thoughts about it. Anyway, this is all, your dynamics are going to be different than my dynamics. Uh, I was, especially with the last company, I, it was a transition. I wasn't staying on. There wasn't a buyout. I, they paid cash for my company. They kept, they kept my people, but they eventually lost most of the, the senior, almost all senior management um, over about two years. Even though we had non-competes, we had all this. They tried to tie us up, uh, and uh, so we couldn't leave. Not me, but the others. But I had a non-compete, too. Anyway, I, I, I find that there's probably some really good books out there, which I would, I would read the next time uh, if, if once uh, I get in that situation again, which I hope to be, where I'm acquired, uh, or IPO, whatever we do. That was also interesting to IPO. I've done twice, two of those. So that was uh, quite a, a crazy ride. One, both, both were pre the, the bubble bursting. So those were quite interesting times. So I love that. That was uh, quite, uh, uh, as I said, a ride at the time. I, I sing that song. Those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. Uh, so, so, so the acquisitions and the IPOs and all of this is exciting, but there's all these uh, pitfalls that, uh, but I'm sure that you will get lots of advice from many people on how to face. So what was the hardest thing about doing the IPOs? Well, you can't control the market. <laughs> so we were, we had already IPO'd with Certicon in 1995. We went on the uh, over the counter in, in Toronto, so we were going on the Nasdaq in March of two thousand, and yeah, right when the crash started. So we're on a road trip in New York, you know, our firm that was working with us on it, and we were standing up there giving presentations, and all you can see is that the stock market, the, the especially the tech market, going down like this. And it was just like, you can't control the timing of external factors. But I do want to say that we should have known. One of our biggest investors was Paul Allen in Certicom. He's the co-founder of Microsoft. And we knew when he, he pulled his money out, and we knew he was, he told us he's going to 
pull it out. He's, and he was going to pull out all of the money from all of his tech investments. And he had a lot of them. So we should have been a little smarter and realized that I don't know if he had so much insight that he saw it coming or if he precipitated it. That the, 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 the burst, the bust. And that he... You mean him pulling out all of his money from all his investments caused everyone to panic? Well, he's a very wealthy person, right? He's in a lot of tech company. Microsoft sees him do it. Intel in, sees him do it. it all these... In 2000, though? Like, how much was he worth? Oh, he's like the second... Uh, next to Warren Buffett, probably, at that time. So, yeah. This is Paul Allen. He was a co-founder. He left Microsoft with a lot of money. Sure. I'm not saying that's yeah, true. I think he died I, recently. Saying, yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Uh, I'm not saying he did. Well, this is just my theory. theory. It, well, it's not even a theory. It's just a thought. But all I'm saying is we knew it. It wasn't like he did it behind our back. He told us. He told us why he was doing right. it. And he said, uh, I think it's, you know, it's overvaluated. The valuations are too high. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to liquidate all my investments. And he did. What could you have done differently, though? I, maybe on the timing, we could have maybe accelerated our timing to, to go on the NASDAQ. It didn't. I mean, we ended up going on the NASDAQ anyway. But it was just, all I'm saying is you can't control the markets. You can't control the external, uh, 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 what's happening externally. All you can do is hope that your fundamentals are there and, and they, they will stand up. We, of course, did not get the valuation we had hoped, but we did go on the NASDAQ. And did the company ever reach the number, the, the amount per share that you were hoping to get, even if it took years or how did that perform? Pre, pre the, pre NASDAQ, pre 2000, the shares were like $200 a share. CAD or USD? It went down to, it was, it, that was Canadian. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then that was the height. That was the top, and that was probably, I would say 1999, uh, early 2000. Anyway, it was in that time frame, let's say 1999-ish. And, uh, and that was uh, before we went on the NASDAQ. After we went on the NASDAQ, the price did not, uh, it did not recover back to those. And I think we did, I, we, I, we also split. We did a split, so, uh, but we never got back up to $100 a share. Uh, and, uh, and it ended up that BlackBerry acquired us at $3 a share. Wow. Yeah. Lots of lessons, lots of lessons in there, right? So. So, so people like Elon Musk typically tie their wealth in the shares that they have um, because of many reasons, one of them from what I understand being you lower your tax burden by not cementing a, a gain or a loss, or you can uh, loan money from the bank using your shares as collateral in order to avoid paying income tax. And because once you, when, when you borrow money, you're paying interest rather than a capital gains and that's a much lower rate. So when you just said lots of things learned, did you guys, keep the majority of your wealth in that and kind of just watched it go down? Or did you sell some off as time went on? What kind of lessons did you yeah. learn specifically? Yes. Yeah. So uh, well, not only did, did we have shares, we also had stock options. Uh, and of course, stock options. When I left, when I left the company in 1997 to go work for MasterCard, I, I, I didn't, I liquidated a lot. I had to liquidate, I had to exercise all my stock options which I did, and I did very well with those. We had a peel the onion strategy that we took a little money off uh, at, at just on a regular basis. We didn't have it set up like many people do, and it's a good thing to do is set up that you sell so many per quarter so there's the market's not, your decision to sell is not based on anything that you know at that time, so there's no question of inside trading and all that. So in those days, so we just peeled money back uh, uh, off. We took it off. We didn't, we still had the core 
But for our stock options, that was a little different. We had to exercise those. When you exercise those, it's treated as if uh, income immediately. So you have to, you might as well sell them because you need to, uh, you don't, the cost basis is already established at that time and you are taxed on that. So uh, being me being both a Canadian and American, I, I pay taxes in both places and get credits. So I have to consider all of that. So what we did was we took off some, but I do remember one time because God had not set up a selling plan, some stock options came. They ha He had to exercise them and uh, he let them go because it was just, he just knew too much at that time. And it, he didn't want any scrutiny uh, close, you know, he just didn't want that hassle of, of having to justify this. So he just let it go, which is, it was millions of dollars that he just let go. And so with this is, is of course, again, lots of lessons learned is take some off the table as, as, as you can. Uh, but we told, we told our employees, Take off the table, pay off your house. You know, in Canada, you don't get a write off your mortgage. So, uh, your mortgage interest, right? So why don't you just take off some and pay down your mortgage? Uh, you know, do those things and, and make sure you have no that. But there was a young Chinese uh, researcher that we had and he believed in the company extensively and that, it, you know, he was dedicated and he didn't, he didn't take any money off the table. And then it went down to, uh, Anyway, it was sad because we, we encouraged the employees, take, 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 exercise your stock options, get some money out. You've worked really hard for this company, you know, 10, 15 years on building this up. Uh, and so take some money off the table. Yes, definitely something to think about. Um, I, I met a guy who had a company uh, go public in Australia. And it's not terribly clear to me if the company went public at a $300 million valuation or he walked away with the $300 million amount, but he ended up doing um, these like loans from the share and used it to buy properties. He's like building an empire in, in like Louisiana. So he, he left Australia, moved to Louisiana and now he flips houses for a living because he's just got nothing else he, he wants to do. Well, you know, I think that's great. He, he found something that he enjoys and doing that. I, you mentioned, you asked about, what we did with our money, we gave, we gave a lot of it away. We have, we're, I'm a big philanthropist, and and uh, but also I started another company. <laughs> I started, a, you know, two companies, and the last one. But when Scott and I started the, my last, our last company, Trust Point, he was alive. He died, passed away in 2014. We started a company 2012. We both left BlackBerry and started this company for security for the driverless and autonomous vehicles. And it's perfect. We were we worked at, with the U.S. Department of Transportation. We were their security experts, uh, and it happened to be algorithms that Scott had developed. So, uh, and they were in the public domain. Sort of come put so many uh, patents for pat, uh, uh, license free in the public domain to encourage the use of the technology in specific areas. Anyway, so when we when we set that company up, we said it's just to give the money away. And that's what we did with most of it. Uh, I mean, we had some money already, but we gave that sale. We, we almost, almost all of it was given to specific causes that we had already identified. And, uh, so, and then of course the employees got some out of it. So with the, with the trust point deal, it was a cash deal. With the Certicom deal, it was cash. So we didn't get, although, Time to time, I've owned BlackBerry shares and research and motion shares, but it wasn't from the acquisition. So it sounds like you're getting shares in the company that's acquiring you, and then hopefully you're getting some cash too. Yeah. So they're they're a publicly listed company in the U.S. So I would be getting shares in that company, and so the hope is all of the other companies that they're acquiring, if they do better, then the shares will rise. So even if the company even if the company they're acquiring for me doesn't do well. If the other ones do well, or if some of them do well, then hopefully the shares will increase in value. Yes, I, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great play, and I, I wish you the best of luck with it, and I, I, I hope you talk to more people than me. I'm sure you will. I get their advice because there's so much out there in advice. 
I can just take it from my perspective that, um, again, I go back to make sure that you have the authority along with the responsibility to really take your company. I was told that even though I wasn't running the company, uh, that uh, acquired us in, in Waterloo, was in Waterloo, Ontario, that the company would be a, a, a autonomous and that we would have our own directive and that would be treated as a subsidiary with their own profit center. And I didn't want to become a development shop. I said, please don't, you know, that was one of the, the but once they acquire you, then they can say anything they want if they're in the acquisition, but once they acquire you, they've acquired you and the assets. So true. Well, yeah, I guess we'll see. I, I don't, I don't have the LOI yet, so I'm waiting for that, but once I have that, then I'll definitely be doing a lot more uh, asking of questions to different people just to make sure that whatever they're showing me is, is legitimate and not going to waste my time. Because I have other things that I'm trying to do, and I'm putting them aside to do this. So, so I want to make sure that I'm making the right decision. Because if I sign that paper and it's not the right thing, then I could be putting myself in a bad situation. Uh, well... How bad? That's the thing. You have to say, what's the risk here? I know you're, you're losing, you're, you're stepping away from other things that you could be more profitable, is, is what you're saying, and that, that's that trade-off between, I'm going to take this one over another one that could be more lucrative? Or is it just say, not really knowing? We never know going into these things. It's really, hindsight is wonderful. But going into them, like with me, is just saying, what's the pros and cons here? And when I sold my company, there was many reasons to sell it to the company I did. They, they were owned 93% by a foundation that went and built hospitals. All the profits went to build hospitals and schools around the world. You know, there was, all, there was many things on the positive side, but maybe I should have spent more time on the negative side. But it, didn't mean, it doesn't mean I wouldn't have made the same decision. Yeah, I guess one of the positives for me is I really want a second chance to make this idea work because I know that it's really important and I know that it, it can be really cool. The thing is it requires a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of money to build. So if they're willing to give me the money that I need to be able to do it, yeah, why not? Let's see how it goes. At the same time, I was at the same time I was looking at, you know, building a consulting firm and I already have a few companies I've invested in and a few clients that I'm advising. And so, you know, how can I continue all of those things and the podcast and juggle being the CEO of a company that I'm like trying to build again from scratch. So it's, a, I think it's just a lot of things. Well, we'll see. Maybe, maybe we'll touch base in a year and see how it's going because uh, sometimes you do have to prioritize consulting is, can be, Lucrative, but of course it's hard to scale, and it maybe it won't scale as well as uh, the, this uh, venture. And that, as you said, they they're putting a lot of money in you. Know, they're backing you. They they have faith yeah. in you. Speaks that speaks a lot. Sure. Well, the their portfolio play is like around enterprise tools in AI and like metaverse. And so my company was building an enterprise communications platform. So okay. of all of the companies that they have acquired slash want to acquire, mine has the largest potential. Even though all of the other companies are operating and have revenue and profit and customers. So mine is, mine is the, the worst off in terms of the situation. However, has the best potential if we can actually get it off the ground again. So that's what well, I'm sure you will be able right, to. Right. So that's what they're betting on. But the whole original team is gone. They all moved on. I mean, it's been a year. So they've all moved on. They've got other jobs. There's no way they're going to come back. And so I've got to build a new team from scratch and that'll take some time. Yeah, that will. But with your connections, that there are a lot of very talented people out there. I found that out. Like with my company, we have, we've had zero. We've hired a lot of pe new people, but we've had zero leave in the last year. And so the retention is very high. We, we spend a lot of time. As, it takes time, as you said, to find it. But keeping them is very important. 
For sure. I tried really hard to do that with my last team, but when you run out of money, there's not really much you can do. Well, you have to let them go. It's the only thing they can do. As you said, they're not going to work for free for you. Yeah, so. Exactly. So you had mentioned to me off air, you wanted to talk about investing, especially women investing in other women. So what is your particular message around that? What's your philosophy around it and all that? In the U.S. and in Canada, it's 2 to 4% of VC capital goes to women founded companies. One time it was a little more, and we're talking about, you know, two trillion, you know, trillion dollars of four hundred fifty trillion dollars of of VC capital available. So, you know, I I just finished a raise uh, for my company, Profound Impact. We raised over three million dollars. Our target was three. We raised three point one two five million. Uh, so we were oversubscribed. So I was very happy about that. But I had to go to. Uh, not the traditional angel investors. Now, this is a pre-seed. We're not talking to VCs, but we are talking to a lot of men. And it turned out that I couldn't get, I mean, I did get some male investors. But what I found out was there was an untapped group of women, especially women who, who have wealth and, and are philant- they're philanthropic. Many of them have somebody else manage, most of them have somebody else manage their money for them, the family office or wherever. However, they have never angel invested. So I tapped into that stream of women who have wealth, who are interested in this. They don't take all of their wealth. They take a small percentage and they invest in a company like mine, a women founded company. And it turns out there's a new article that I just read in the last few days from the 51 out of Calgary uh, uh, in Canada, that if we could tap in, if men would, in, if women would invest, like men invest in angel and, v- and funds, that's over $3.22 trillion of new capital out there. And so what I'm doing is celebrating that most of my investors were female, women and also women who are investing for the first time in angel, doing angel investing. And now I'm, there's an initiative. I, I've, been, I've been complaining about this for a while. That's why I bring it up, that we need to do something. How, what, do, what, what do we need to do? Do we need to go and help the male VCs understand our us a little better? That became a big no. They're not interested in doing that. They don't think they don't think their system's broken. I do, but that's one voice saying it. I'm not the only voice, but a few of us are saying this. But now we just you just said, you know what? We're just going to change the paradigm. We are going to go after the women who haven't invested, who have the capacity to invest. And it turned out this number. $3.22 trillion that we can get in. So my, I'm working with an, an, a group of women in an organization called Women Funding Women. It's, a, it's just an organization. It's a, a not-for-profit organization to educate, bring up the opportunities, and uh, bring the awareness to say, women, we can invest in other women, and we can change uh, the landscape here. So I'm very proud of that initiative, and I'm also extremely Proud of what uh, that I was able to get investors into my company, first time investors, female investors. So, are you going to create a fund where you get these women to invest into companies, and you're going to find these these female led companies, or are you leaving that out? Some of the women, some of the women in this group already have funds. One has sixty million dollars which is not huge, but sixty million dollars to just a new fund in like two years old. Uh, and so she talked about how she built up the fund. And there's some that have smaller funds, bigger funds. So we have women in the group that already have funds. So we're not, this is not about having another fund, although that's great. I appreciate that. Let's do all we can, get the money in somehow. But it's, it's, it's about bringing the awareness that 
what do we need? What kind of tools do we need? And then we find out that the plus, I'm sorry, the 51 already has these boot camps and training to train women how to angel invest. Or you can encourage them to go into a, an angel network, which there are plenty around here. So there's many different ways to do this, but we want to do them all. But we're not going to reinvent things. We're going to amplify others' works. Let's see. I mean, if there's a, a gap that we identify that, oh, we really need help in this area, we'll do that. If it's encouraging more funds, we will do that. Uh, so it's about just first or uh, saying this is this this is a great opportunity. Let's take it. Let's build on it. Let's figure out who needs to be at the table. Invite them, investors, founders. So we're hoping to have an event to bring people in in early in the in the new year to say, okay, how do we continue this conversation? How do we we get to that three point two two trillion dollars in funding for women? So, what is the most important thing you've learned so far in your life from? starting companies, scaling companies, selling companies, going public, and helping women to fund other women? Many things, but the one that I heard recently, and I've now adopted it, from Stacey Allister. She is the, uh, she's the tournament director for the U.S. Open. You, you're underestimating me. Oh, this is going to be fun. So don't underestimate me. Because I, uh, resilient, I persist, I'm going to get this done. 